Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to be before you today, and it's a great pleasure because I get the opportunity to talk about two things that I love, cities and Seattle. And um, I, I want to start, I guess, by acknowledging the goal that is set out for this conference, and which sounds to me like the goal for the city of Sydney and the region. And that is resilient, happy, and prosperous. And I have to share with you that that's not unique to Sydney. That is the goal of every mayor in every city in every part of the world. We try, and sometimes we succeed, and sometimes we don't, to create a future that is resilient, happy, and prosperous for our people. And so I'd like to share a few stories with you uh, from Seattle's experience in uh, trying to do that, and mine in particular. First, happy. We uh, in Seattle are home to some wonderful uh, amenities. I got a chance yesterday to talk about our Pike Place Market and what a wonderful gathering place it is for all the people of our city. We have great parks. Uh, we have wonderful libraries. Uh, we have great cultural uh, institutions, the Seattle Art Museum, the Seattle Opera doesn't have the, the facility that you have and the statement that your facility makes about the importance of the art, but it produces great, great uh, art inside its walls. Uh, we have a few sports teams. The, those of you who follow Seattle uh, or U.S. football uh, might recognize the name of the Seattle Seahawks. I'm a soccer fan and the Seattle Sounders uh, are about to uh, play for the championship of their league. They won the, the table uh, for the regular season, and we in America have these playoffs, and we love our playoffs. So we not only won our regular season, but we're hoping to win the, the playoffs as well. Let me tell you a little about Seattle's history. Uh, we have a great history of innovation and creativity. Uh, we have a, a, a tradition of very visionary entrepreneurs. Bill Boeing. Bill Boeing came to Seattle a little over a century ago. Came to Seattle actually for the timber. He became uh, obsessed with flight. Uh, and 98 years ago created a small company uh, that is still building its airplanes in Seattle. That company eventually built the 707, which helped to create the jet age, which helped to shrink our globe. The work done by Bill Gates and Paul Allen in the information technology to help create uh, the, uh, the knowledge industry, the knowledge age that we are in today, and how that helped to shrink our globe. And maybe most creative of all, the good folks at Starbucks who figured out how to charge $4 US for a cup of coffee. And people stand in line all over America. I understand there's a difference of opinion about who has better coffee, but People in America and many countries stand in line to enjoy that coffee and enjoy the social experience that they have created around that coffee. So that innovation and that creativity is something that I think is the hallmark of great cities, and you have it here uh, in Sydney. Now, one of the barriers that we had in Seattle when I became mayor to continuing that entrepreneur spirit and to continue it in the public sector was something I'm going to call the Seattle process. The Seattle process had two or three steps. The first was to bring everyone around a large table, and that's a really good thing. Everyone who has invested their blood or their treasure in your city deserves a spot at the table. And that's something that you're going to, you're discovering today and yesterday and over the next few months. Everyone needs to be invited around that table. The problem with the Seattle process was once that finished, if someone still disagreed, they did it over again. And if someone disagreed at that point, they did it over again. And in today's age of co global competition, if you cannot make decisions and move forward and then take on the next thing and the next thing, you're going to be left behind. The competition is going to overwhelm you. And so when I became mayor, I said, we're going to bring everyone around a table. We, we, uh, respect and honor that tradition. But at the end of the day, the last person to say no will not have a veto. 
we will make a decision and we will move forward. And that was a little jarring for people uh, in Seattle, but it was important. And uh, fortunately, I got a chance to prove that pretty quickly. Uh, the staff at the city, the planning staff, I'm not a planner, I'm a politician. And I get up uh, every day wanting to get something done. The planners like to look out into the distant future, that's an important thing. So the planners came into my office and they said, your predecessor started a project. It was called the Height and Density Project and we're ready to issue the report. And I told them, if you issue that report, it is the last thing you will do as city employees. Because Western cities in the United States, and I suspect we're not unique, hate sprawl and despise density. It's a dichotomy. You cannot have it both ways. But nonetheless, they were both very strongly held positions. And so what we needed to do was to step back and ask the people of our city, what kind of a place do you want this to be? What do you want us to look like and feel like 20 and 40 years from now? And what the people told us, we had a two year long conversation. We brought in, as in this group, although when the Premier, Premier Baird said that we were brought together the best minds, I looked around because I thought maybe I had walked in the wrong room that I didn't really belong. But, um, but I have, in listening to everybody, uh, agree with the Premier and I'm very honored to have been, uh, been asked to participate as a, a simple former mayor from Seattle. But we uh, asked people that question and what they said to us was very simple. They wanted Seattle to become a dynamic and vibrant 24-7 city. They wanted a diversity of activities and opportunities and people. At that point, we could talk about density as one of the tools to achieve that vision that they shared for our city. And we did. And we greatly increased the densities in our single family neighborhoods, which are very treasured uh, in uh, US culture and in Seattle perhaps particular. We doubled the density in our single family neighborhoods. We reduced parking requirements. We previously had required one and a half parking places for every housing unit that was built in an apartment or a condominium. What that meant was that, that cost, which in US dollars is about $25,000 a space, so roughly $35,000 to $40,000 per unit, meant that you were going to build fewer units, they would be larger units, and they'd be more expensive. They would be a barrier to creating affordable housing. We did away with those parking requirements. We said the market will determine what parking you would have to provide within your building. It wasn't happily accepted by the entire community, but I think people, by and large, uh, have learned to, uh, to live with it and, and, in some cases, support it strongly. Um, so we needed to have that conversation before we could move forward uh, on some of the goals that we had for uh, increasing the density of our city, reducing the carbon footprint of our overall community, and achieving many other uh, important goals. The first opportunity I had to do that was a neighborhood, not really a neighborhood, a mall, Northgate Mall. Northgate Mall in Seattle was created in 1950. It was one of the first post-war auto-oriented malls in America. And unfortunately, it really hadn't changed very much uh, in the 60 years uh, following that. And it wasn't doing particularly well. And one of the reasons it wasn't doing particularly well was that a political logjam had been created between the, the merchants, the property owners, and the neighbors. The neighbors had a very particular goal. They wanted to take a creek that had been buried below asphalt and bring it back to the air and the light. This, of course, would have reduced the amount of rentable space. And that was something that uh, some of the economic interests didn't want to see and it would be expensive to do in and of itself. And there was no way to get those uh, different viewpoints to coalesce. So my job as mayor was to blow up that log jam. Literally stick, not literally, but stick a uh, stick of dynamite in there and blow it up. And then bring the community together 
to figure out where we wanted those pieces to be put back together. And what we ended up with was a rejuvenated uh, commercial center that now has a good deal of housing around it. And yes, we now have a creek that has op is now open to the air and the light. And we have residents along that creek at about 100 units per acre. Very, very dense, but very, very well done and uh, providing this environmental enhancement along with places, uh, affordable places for people to live. So the people who at the beginning, when I blew up the log jam that everybody had ownership of, would have hung me in effigy, uh, they came to the groundbreaking for this, uh, this project and all took credit for it. And as mayor, that was success. People who had opposed it now took credit for it. They felt ownership of it, and they felt like there was hope for a quality of life improvement in their neighborhood. There was another opportunity uh, that we had. We had an area not unlike the Bay's Precinct, an area of warehouses that had never immediately adjacent to our CBD that never really blossomed. There were some interesting businesses in there, but not a lot had happened, and the reason is that it had a freeway on the east that blocked access. It had a freeway on the west that blocked access. And it had a lake on the north that provided sort of a moat type effect. The, the neighborhood is known as South Lake Union. And so we decided that we wanted to do more in that area, right by the central business district. And we developed a vision uh, for that area. Uh, and we shared that vision, and we talked about it, and we have since achieved some great things. And let me put some perspective around that. After winning the election, uh, we were in a, uh, uh, a recession. It was right after 9-11. Boeing, the company I talked about earlier, was laying off 30,000 people because nobody was buying airplanes. The tourism and convention business was shut down because nobody wanted to travel. So we had about 100,000 people out of work. So my first job as I took office was to try and find that prosperous future and figure out how we could create jobs, not only in the short term, uh, but in the long term. So I sat down with the CEOs of all of our great companies, the CEOs of, uh, of Boeing and Microsoft, Starbucks, Amazon.com, Costco, uh, back then, Washington Mutual, which was a, a bank that was destroyed in the credit crisis. Um, I sat down with the CEOs and I asked them, what is it about this region that makes it a good place to do business and how can we help you be more successful in putting more people to work? And I got some good answers from them and it became clear pretty quickly that the number one economic asset that Seattle has the reason that we have this strong entrepreneurial tradition is the fact that the uh, United States' number one public research university, the University of Washington, is in the heart of our city. It means that they bring in a billion and a half dollars a year U.S. in research grants, two-thirds of which are in the life sciences. They bring in thousands of young, eager minds every year, and they uh, add them to our economy. And so I said, OK, the University of Washington, that's something we better pay some attention to. So I went and I, I, I talked to some of our people about that. The policy of the city of Seattle toward the University of Washington when I became mayor was the very same policy that the United States had toward the Soviet Union in, in 1950. It was a policy of containment. We didn't want the university to sneak out of its campus and become part of the community. We wanted it separate. We changed that to a policy of engagement. We wanted to know what was going on at the university because the research that takes place there tells us what tomorrow's economy is going to look like. It's a crystal ball. And a great metropolitan area that has a research university has a leg up, I think, on any other community. And so that engagement with the University of Washington was, was very important. South Lake Union, the neighborhood I was talking about, is very, very close to the University of Washington. And so we decided as a strategy that we would create something based on that life sciences 
billion dollar a year research industry. That we would create a place for research institutions like the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Institute, the Seattle Biomedical Research Institute, the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, uh, PATH. These are all global organizations that are working on some of the worst health uh, challenges that we as human beings face. And as an aging human being, I can tell you I have more and more interest in that every day. And I want them to be successful. We also happen to have the largest philanthropic organization in the history of the world, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And they announced that they wanted to relocate to a permanent headquarters. So we sold them 13 acres of land adjacent to the South Lake Union community, and they've now built their permanent headquarters there. That means that these research institutions have access to that grant money. In turn, uh, various commercial uh, operations, pharmaceutical companies and the like, now want to be in that neighborhood so that they can access the research that's being funded by the philanthropy. So we've created an economic uh, place. We put a streetcar in so that somebody, a researcher at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center can hop on the streetcar, go to the Starbucks by PATH, meet a researcher from PATH, and share in what they're talking about, what they're looking at, collaborate. And we've created uh, some 15,000 jobs in that neighborhood. We've created several thousand housing units. And ironically, we've attracted other kinds of companies. Small company called Amazon.com just built their headquarters in South Lake Union. Uh, the day they opened their headquarters, which was about a year ago, they started construction on their next headquarters, which will be three 40-story towers uh, adjacent to the CBD. So we figured out some ways to try and create uh, economic opportunity and a prosperous future uh, for our people. Uh, the Lord Mayor showed a picture of the uh, C40 that met in New York in 2007. I should have been in that picture, but the night before I was to leave, my father passed. And so I was unable to make it, but I saw some very familiar faces there. And that coming together in 2007, work that was done the next year at COP15 in Copenhagen, um, was very important. In the United States, in the time that I was mayor, I assumed when I became mayor that we had very smart people working on climate issues that we had the luxury of a little bit of time to try and figure this thing out. But I discovered I was wrong. We didn't have people working on it. In fact, we were denying it was happening. And we decided, uh, as a country apparently, to try and ignore it. So as mayor of Seattle, I had what we call an aha moment. In the winter of 2004, 2005, it was a very warm winter. Not quite as warm as today, but it felt warm uh, back home for this time of year. Uh, and that's a problem. It was dry, it was warm. In Seattle, we've built sustainable century-old systems for water and for power. And they both rely on snow falling in our Cascade Mountains. They both rely on that snow melting at some point, capturing it, and either running it through turbines for power or running it into the city in pipes for water. So when we get a dry, warm winter, we don't get that. It was so serious that my colleague, the mayor of Tacoma, and I went on the radio and urged people to shower together. And even in the Pacific Northwest, that is uh, not a normal uh, thing for mayors to advocate. So, um, so the power of leadership doesn't just mean leadership within your own local community by a mayor, but often it will mean looking at something that's going to affect your city in our case, water and power, if we didn't do anything about climate, and using the power, the collective power of local leadership to, uh, to act on something. So in 2005, February 16th, the Kyoto Agreement became law in 141 countries, but not the United States, and maybe one or two other countries. Um, and so that day, I pledged that Seattle would reduce its emissions by the amount called for the Kyoto Treaty. 
But I knew that if it was only Seattle, it would be purely symbolic. And as the Lord Mayor can tell you, people don't change behaviors for purely symbolic reasons. There has to be a substantive reason. And so I urged other mayors to join with me. First, the, the usual suspects, uh, cities like San Francisco, Portland, Minneapolis. But ultimately, we had over 1,000 mayors join us. The 1,000th mayor was a Republican mayor from Mesa, Arizona. So we pretty much covered the gamut. Uh, and we got mayors in every state of the union. They represented over 90 million Americans. So it was no longer purely symbolic. And we did it for local reasons. We did it so that our water, our power, the livability of our city, and the ability for our children and our grandchildren to survive as a human species would be maintained. So the collective power of your local voices is important, whether it be on something global like climate change or something local like uh, building a transportation system that doesn't rely exclusively on expanding highways. Um, and then resilience. Climate certainly is an issue for resilience. I'm very honored that today on the panel uh, that Sir Bob Parker is going to be joining us, the former mayor of Christchurch. He was mayor during the, the terrible earthquake uh, that they had, and he was a hero in leading his city through that crisis and making sure that that city was resilient and could bounce back. When I became mayor in 2002, I visit, and Christchurch is a sister city of Seattle, and I've had the pleasure of uh, visiting there. Another sister city of Seattle is Kobe, Japan. Kobe, Japan had an earthquake in 1995 that killed about 6,000 people. And so when we were celebrating our 45th anniversary of that sister city relationship in 2002, I was to go over and visit, and there were a lot of ceremonies planned. And I said, let's not do the ceremonial visit. Let's sit down and let's talk about this, because that's something that Kobe and Seattle and Christchurch and all of us on the ring of fire around the Pacific share, and that is the, the thought that we could be vulnerable to a, uh, a major, major uh, earthquake at some point. And so I spent time with the officials in Kobe talking about how they had planned prior to the 1995 uh, uh, earthquake, what they learned from it, and what they had done. And it was incredibly helpful to me uh, as mayor of Seattle because I, I learned that most of the people died in fires after the earthquake. 196 fires broke out, but the fire stations were collapsed. The water system had been destroyed, and so they had no way to fi fight those 196 fires. So I came home to Seattle, and I went to my fire chief, and I said, what would happen in a similar earthquake? And he told me that two-thirds of our fire stations would collapse. So we went to the public, and we said, we need to fix this. We need to make sure that if, if and in fact when, the big one comes, we have the ability to provide water to not only fight fire, but for human use. We need to make sure that our fire services at our point of greatest need are ready to respond and to save lives. And the voters stepped up and they voted to tax themselves to fix every fire station, all 33 fire stations across our city. And so by working together, we were able to make our city more resilient. And when the big one does come, and it's about 250 years overdue uh, in Seattle, um, people may not remember my name, but if I'm still around, I will know that we have saved some lives. At the local level, even when our federal our national government is dysfunctional, as I would call the United States Congress and the United States federal government, we can still function at the local level because we can see each other, we look each other in the eye every day. As mayor, I went to the same supermarkets, I shopped in the same stores as my neighbors, my friends, my constituents, my bosses, and we can look each other in the eye and tell our, each other what we think in fairly direct terms. At least the public felt pretty uh, able to do that when I was mayor. And therefore, there's an honesty to that conversation. You cannot simply say things like climate change don't exist and get away with that. You need to deal with it in an honest and direct fashion. And so as you go through this process, as you engage your public, as your local governments uh, 
weigh in on what they want to see happen uh, with the uh, Bayes Precinct. I wish you great luck. You have an incredible opportunity to shape a future, a future that you decide on, a future that you will shape, and a future that I hope you get to enjoy. Thank you very much.